Today we are looking at the Focusrite Solo in the fourth generation and compare it to a few other interfaces, including its predecessor. Hey, Julian Klaus here, and I think I've been holding off the fourth gen Solo review long enough now, but there's actually a benefit to that because there have been a few software upgrades which improve the functionality of the Solo. So let's have a look at how the interface performs, what kind of features it provides, and where Focusrite have made a step back from the third generation. The Scarlet Solo is Focusrite's entry-level interface for people who only need one single mic input and an additional line or instrument input. If you need more I.O., Focusrite does have a few other interfaces like the 2i2 and 4i4, which I've also reviewed on this channel. But in this video we are focusing on the Solo. Also, full disclosure, I bought the Solo with my own money. This video is not sponsored. Let's check the hardware. First of all, you get two gain knobs to control the gain for the mic input and line input. The knobs are surrounded by LED level meters, which I think is a nice touch, and this way you can also quickly see your level and if you're clipping. Speaking of the line input, there is a button located on the front, which can toggle between line or instrument. So you can directly hook up an electric guitar or line level device to the solo. You can also toggle the setting in the software, to which I will get a little later. You also get a button to turn on phantom power, which you need for condenser microphones, and an air mode button, which gives the recorded audio an airy sound, and I will demonstrate this a little later as well. One more welcome change from the previous generation is that you now have a separate output dial for the main output and the headphone volume. The headphone port is on the front and there is also a direct monitoring button which lets you listen to the recorded audio without any delay. You can even fine tune this via the software, again more on that later. On the back you can find the USB-C connection to connect the interface to your PC, a set of balanced quarter inch outputs and an XLR mic input. In the last generation the mic input was on the front, now it's on the back, that's very much a preference thing but something to be aware of. Hardware-wise, the Solo feels really quite good, the housing is out of metal and the knobs turn smoothly. If we have a quick look inside, we can see that the AD and DA conversion is done with some high-quality converters, and of course we're going to see how this affects the audio quality later in this video. Not much else to mention about the build quality, it's really quite good, and because most connections are on the back, there's ample of space on the front to easily use all the buttons and knobs. Let's have a look at the audio quality with some measurements. And no worries, I will explain what all the squiggly lines mean in practice. Here's the frequency response of the mic input at the maximum gain setting, which you might use with a dynamic microphone. You essentially want to see a straight line here for all frequencies to be recorded equally. But here the solo does not fare too well with some roll off in the higher and lower frequencies. This might lead to some very slight attenuation of the high frequency sparkle, but because dynamic microphones usually have a limited frequency range anyways, this will really not be that audible in practice. So don't worry about this too much. Then again, I do expect a better technical performance these days. If you use less gain, like it is the case for condenser mics, the frequency response is nice and flat, which is exactly how it should be. All good. Distortions are really not an issue with the mic input. In this graph you can see that they are below the noise floor. No complaints here. Dynamic range is the ratio of the strongest signal that the interface can capture and its noise floor. And you want this to be as high as possible to be able to leave yourself some handroom while recording without introducing additional noise. Good news because the solo comes in with about 113 dBA, which is not record breaking but a really solid amount of dynamic range and this should be fine for everything but the most dynamic cases. For singing and spoken word, this is already more than you need. Now you might ask yourself the question, am I already subscribed and how good is the preamp noise on the solo? This is important for when you use dynamic microphones, which only produce a very low level signal, which needs to be amplified a lot. I'm currently using an SM7B because this is one of the worst mics in terms of signal output, so this is a real stress test for the preamp. Here's how the noise floor sounds like. That noise is hardly audible, so it's no wonder that the Solo is in the top ranking interfaces in terms of preamp noise. Here's how this compares audibly to a few other interfaces. The Solo even outperforms the 4th Gen 2i2 and 4i4 by about 2 decibels, and this is because of the analog gain control. But we will get to the downsides of the solution a little later. Gain-wise, the Solo does not have as much as the 2i2, but in my opinion, this is still enough to drive even gain-hungry microphones to a proper recording level. Because of that and the very low noise preamp, you really do not need a fat clouder or similar inline preamp, 
that's just a waste of money as the Solos preamp is already so good. While I'm already using a more muffled mic, let me quickly demonstrate the air mode. When turning it on, you can instantly hear an increase in the higher frequencies. This gives the audio essentially a presence boost, which leads to a more airy sound. In the presence mode, it's not doing anything else, so this is really like an EQ applied to the recorded audio, which can give your recordings a brighter sound with the push of a button. There is a second setting available, which is called Presence Plus Drive, and I have it activated now. This works slightly differently in that the frequency response now has a pretty strong V-shape, accentuating the bass and treble. In addition, there is some saturation added, which leads to a more gritty sound. One downside I see with the air mode on the solo is that this feature is only enabled for the mic input and it is not possible to be used with the Lino instrument input, which is a bit unfortunate. The line input is pretty boring, and I mean that in a good way. The frequency response is ruler flat, distortions are at an inaudible level, and the dynamic range is really quite good again with roughly 113 dBA. The solo can also accept a proper professional line level signal, which is always great to see. Jumping to the main output on the back, we can also see some great audio quality. The frequency response is ruler flat again, and distortions are really low and really not audible. The dynamic range has surpassed the human hearing, so there's really no way you will hear any noise from the output. I would consider the main output on the solo to be transparent, meaning that you only hear the played back music without any distortion or noise. Excellent performance. The headphone output is quite a bit more interesting, because while we get a few improvements over the previous generation, there is also a downgrade which you can easily spot in my overview table here. In the third gen I was complaining about audible amounts of distortion, and it is great to see that this has been pretty much completely resolved with the fourth generation. I would consider these amounts of distortion inaudible. The power output has also been increased, meaning that you will be able to drive headphones to a louder level, and generally speaking, the Solo has enough power to get the most headphones on the market decently loud. Noise-wise, the performance is good. Maybe with sensitive IEMs, you might be able to hear an ever so slight hiss, but with over-ear headphones, you should be fine. But this leads me to the point where Focusrite made an interesting decision. I'm of course talking about the output impedance. Why is the high output impedance of the Solo such a big deal? The issue is that due to the high output impedance, the sound signature of certain headphones can change. Some headphones are affected more, like the red one here, and some are affected less, like the blue one. If you happen to use the red one, you will have a massive boost of 4 dB in the bass area, and this changes the sound very noticeably. The issue is that it is hard to know if this will be an issue for you or not, as this problem changes so much with different headphones. For an audio device that aims to let you monitor audio in an unaltered way, to make good recording and mixing decisions, this is a big no-go in my opinion. You can kind of mitigate this by using headphones with a higher impedance, I would say at least 80 ohms, as they are less affected by this issue. But it's also not great that the interface now forces you to use higher impedance headphones to get accurate sound. I know the impedance is a compromise that Focusrite had to make, but I would have liked to see them compromise on something else than audio quality. Before wrapping up this video, let's have a quick look at the software, because here the most improvements have been made. When you install Focusrite Control 2, you get a control panel, where you can monitor your input levels, and also toggle functions like phantom power from the software, so you don't need to reach for your interface. One thing I find a bit confusing is that the channel 1 is the line input, and channel 2 is the mic input. I guess most people are going to use the mic input and expect this to be channel 1. Because of that, some software cannot see the second channel and then you would have an issue getting your mic audio into the software. Luckily, Focusrite has added a function which outputs a combination of channel 1 and 2 to the first channel and then it works again. Besides the mixing, I would have liked to see a simple swap feature so that the mic comes out on channel 1 and the line input on level 2, which, let's be real, should have been like this in the first place. In the direct monitoring section, you get a complete overview of your in and outputs, and you can actually dial in how much you hear each of them in your direct monitoring mix. I find this super useful and much more practical than a simple monitoring on-off button or even a mix dial that you can find on some interfaces. If you know me, I had to check how real-time the real-time monitoring really is, and there's just a tiny bit of delay from the ADDA conversion, but this is not audible, so don't worry about it. Speaking of delay, here are the round trip latencies with different buffer sizes. This is important for when you use effects on your PC and still want to monitor them in real time, like for example with an MSIM. 
With lower sample rates, the solo fares okay, although I've seen better even with Focusrite's own third generation. With higher sample rates, the RTL shortens, so if a short delay is important for you and your PC can handle it, I would advise to stick to the higher sample rates. Lastly, if you compare the solo to the 2i2 and 4i4, you will notice that some software functions are missing, namely the save mode and auto gain. Save mode changes your gain, which can prevent clipping, and auto gain sets your gain to a decent recording level, which can be very useful when you you're just starting out and you do not know where to set your gain at. These features are only possible because of the digitally controlled gain in the 2i2 and 4i4, but because the gain is controlled in an analog fashion in the solo, these features are not present. I think Focusrite aims the solo more towards people starting out with music production, and I think these are the people who could benefit the most from the aforementioned features, so it's kind of a bummer that the solo does not have these. This also means that you cannot control the gain from the software and you have to physically turn the dial on the solo. Just something to be aware of. Verdict time, and let's quickly talk about the pros and cons. On the plus side, I really like that Focusrite has gone away with the single volume knob and you now have dedicated knobs for the headphone and main output volume. On the software side, we also see some handy features like a fully controllable direct monitoring mix and loopback. Then there's the air mode in two different flavors to give your recordings a bit more character. Generally speaking, the audio quality is really good. The mic input is ultra low noise, even edging out the bigger scarlets. This is because of the analog gain control and this brings me to the downsides. Because it's an analog gain knob, you can only control the gain on the device itself and not in the software. And there are no save mode or auto gain features like you can find on the 2i2 and 4i4. I know I've already complained about it enough, but I will mention it here again, the headphone output impedance is simply too high in my opinion. So if very accurate sound reproduction is important for you, you might want to stick to headphones with a higher impedance. But yeah, I think besides these points, it's a nice little red interface with some welcome improvements over the third generation. Alright, give this video a thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't already done so, and I will see you all in the next one.